Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I'm glad to be here with you tonight. Uh, the Woodland Stewards Program is a really great program. I'm happy to be a part of it here. Um, and I came last year and remembered the great food, and I'm eating for two this year, so took full advantage of that. Um, so I'm going to talk about preserving forested lands. If you have any questions as I'm going along, please uh, let me know. And if I don't get to something by the end, we can cover it then. Um, just a couple of statistics that you may be well aware of. Uh, forests cover about 42 or 41 percent of the state, 2.6 million acres. About a quarter of that is already in public ownership, and 76 percent is in private. There are a lot of stressors to our resources lands. Um, the State Department of Planning projects that the Maryland population will increase by about a million by 2035, and we are the U.S. is fifth most densely populated state. And since 1950, Maryland has lost about 7,000 acres of land to development each year. So that's pretty significant over time, especially. And these days, highways and technology are making employment centers and jobs more accessible from places that were formerly remote and less accessible. So it's, you know, again, opening up our resource lands. And the development that's occurring is oftentimes um, developing in a patchwork of um, resource land surrounded by subdivisions and dissected by roads. And when this happens, it really compromises the integrity of our resource lands. So why preserve forest land? Um, there's, there's a lot of reasons. Um, air quality, a single mature tree can absorb 13 pounds of CO2 a year. So when you talk about that on a forest level, that can really be significant. Estate planning, a personal reason that um, we're going to talk about in a little more detail in a bit. Um, habitat, an uh, interesting statistic I found was that 90% of endangered species depend, at least for a portion of their life cycle, on forested habitat. And a lot of times, they're looking for core habitat, not just the edges and the fringes, but large forested pieces. Um, natural legacy and quality of life, um, thinking about your children and grandchildren and what is to become of the land and wanting to maintain and support healthy rural economies um, are a benefit to preserving our lands. All the recreational opportunities, camping and hiking, birding, hunting, all of those things. Um, maintaining the beautiful scenic rural landscapes, preserving the lands helps to, helps to do that. The viability of forestry and all of the forest um, product jobs that can be created and maintained by our forests. And then water quality, of course, all of the benefits there that forests provide. So this slide is kind of um, organized in top down and bottom up. There are different ways that we can go about preserving land. And the real top down way is zoning. So saying what types of land use can occur where. And the comprehensive planning process where water and sewer are going to be allocated and go. Um, preferential tax assessments, so encouraging um, through, the, through your, your property taxes, different land uses, such as doing a forest management plan and getting a preferential tax assessment that, day, that way. TDRs and PDRs are different um, types of purchased, um, purchase programs, purchase easements, and then donated conservation easements, which is what I'm mainly going to be talking about and is really the bottom-up approach to land preservation. So Maryland is really unique in that we have a whole suite of options to landowners. And I'll refer you to this, um, this paper that I handed out. We recently put this together to kind of summarize a lot of the programs that are available in the state. And um, you know, each of these programs has their own set of criteria and can be location specific or land use specific or require certain quality of soils. There's really a lot of options, so I'd encourage you, if you're interested, um, 
to look at this and that gives you websites and contact information for the different programs. Again, I'm going to be talking mainly about MET and our donated conservation easements. We work with uh, local land trust partners where local land trusts are um, located in the state and oftentimes we will co-hold easements with our local land trusts. Um, so then getting into MET, we are over 40 years old now, established in 1967, and we accepted our first easement donation in 1972. We're a statewide land trust. We're affiliated with the Department of Natural Resources, and we have a private citizen board of trustees. We have, to date, protected almost 130,000 acres. We should reach that this year on over 1,050 easements um, across the across the state and we are one of the largest land trusts in the country. So a lot of you, about half or so more, are familiar with conservation easements and for those that aren't, uh, conservation easement is a legal agreement between a landowner and a land trust that permanently limits the use of the land in order to protect what we call conservation values. And what are conservation values? They can be a number of things. Um, these are examples of some of the big ones that we are looking to protect. So, and they correspond with why we want to protect forested lands to begin with. Um, so scenic view sheds from either public roads or public waterways, habitat and water quality, uh, historical sites and cultural sites of significance we look for as well agricultural land and forested land, and again, for water quality, stream, and riparian protections. A few of the key characteristics of easements, they are perpetual, they last forever. They are, it is a recorded deed of easement that is recorded with the county land records and runs with the land. They are voluntary, um, and so I really enjoy the voluntary aspect of them because the landowners that come to me are, sure. Sorry, did all of them perpetual or just MET? Um, it depends on the program. MET easements are perpetual. When we first began, we had uh, probably less than a handful of term easements, but these days they are perpetual, lasting forever. But it depends on the program. Mm -hmm. um, is that also if it's sold to somebody else? Yep. Um, yeah, it runs with the land, and so um, when it's sold or passed on to the next generation, it still remains under easement. Yep. They are voluntary, um, so people that come to us are enthusiastic, usually, and not this isn't a regulatory program in any way. Um, they contain flexible terms. Every property is unique, and so we work with the landowner to really capture your goals and wishes and make sure they fit with our criteria to craft an easement that can be, will last forever. It's flexible enough that it, um, it's not so structured that um, in the future it's going to be impossible to enforce, basically. Um, and it allows landowners to continue to use and own and manage the property as you see fit and to pass it along and sell it, sell it or pass it along to your heirs. Some of the um, key terms and provisions of an easement. Industrial and commercial activities are limited by a conservation easement. Um, agriculture and timber harvesting, those things are commercial activities that are permitted by easements. Our standard um, buffer for a water body is 100 feet. We require a 100 foot buffer along water bodies to protect water quality again. Residences and subdivision are two things that we make sure that are very clear in the easement. Um, when you're donating an easement, you are essentially giving up most if not all of the development rights that are remaining on the property. And so um, in certain 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 circumstances, you may reserve the right to build a residence in the future or to subdivide a section of the property, but we want to make sure that that's clearly defined in the easement document up front. Uh, public access is not a requirement. Um, that's sometimes a 
misconception about conservation easements. Um, we do, we also work in urban areas, and so there we are looking for public access, but in our more rural lands, uh, it's not at all a requirement. And again, perpetuity, they last forever. So why might you be interested in donating a conservation easement? I think um, what has to go along with your desire to donate a conservation easement is kind of what we were trying to capture in this postcard is your legacy. Um, you have to you know, want your land to remain essentially as it is and available to the next generations. Um, but there are also financial incentives, and those come by way of potential tax benefits that you may be eligible for when you donate an easement. And I'm going to go through uh, each of them, and I will refer you to our brochure inside in this gold box here. It details what each of those benefits is, and then also refers you to our website where there are some examples of how the numbers might work out in uh, your circumstance. Again, is that MEP only, or is those, I know the property tax credit goes for the other easements, but. The, this is just MET, yep. So the other ones don't have the present deduction. Um, it depends on the program, yeah, it's all program specific. Okay. But some of these are uh, very MET specific that make you eligible for some of these. So, for the federal benefit, um, well first let me back up. The, the income tax benefits are based on an appraisal that you will get. And the appraisal is not your just typical property appraisal. It's kind of a two-in-one appraisal. And so the appraisal is going to look at the property as it is today. How many development rights are there, what, um, what the market value is there. And then it, the appraiser will look at the easement document and what exactly you're giving up. And it will come up with a value for the um, value of the property after the easement's in place. And the difference in those two values is the value of your donation and what your income tax benefits are based on. And so everything is very um, property specific and how they impact you is very uh, specific to your own financial situation. And so we always, um, here's my small print, we always suggest that you talk with a financial advisor to see how they might affect you and or run the numbers yourself to see how they might impact you. So the federal income tax deduction um, allows you to deduct 50% of your adjusted gross income in the year of the donation and 15 years forward or until you reach the total value of your donation. And if you are a, an IRS qualified farmer or rancher, you can actually deduct 100% of your adjusted gross income in the year of the donation and 15 years forward. And my big takeaway for tonight is that th these numbers here, the 50% over 15 years, is just guaranteed through the end of 2013. Um, the, this benefit is at what they call the enhanced level. It was first enhanced um, in 2006, and um, Congress has been extending this for two year or one year increments since then. And um, last year we operated not knowing what was going to happen. It wasn't until January of 2013 that the enhancement was made retroactive for all donations in 2012 and extended just through the end of 2013. And so, we really don't know what's going to happen after 2013, so that's just a piece of information. If you might be considering a donated easement, that uh, that might spur you into acting this year. Um, when it is back to the unenhanced, unenhanced level, uh, it is 30% of adjusted gross income over six years. And so the enhanced level really allows you or people of uh, more modest income to take greater advantage of the full value of your donation. So that's my takeaway there. The state income tax uh, benefit, I'm mainly going to be talking about the credit. You can also take the state income tax as a deduction, but most people 
I would say 99% um, the credit is more valuable than a deduction. So the credit allows you, and this is just for MET easements, um, allows you to get a credit of your state income tax of 5000 per year per owner. So if the property is owned by husband and wife, it's a $10,000 credit per year. Um, and for each of the following 15 years, or to the value of the donation. So 80000 per individual or 160000 per uh, couple if a husband and wife is owning the property. So estate tax. Um, there are two ways that a, an easement can uh, benefit estate taxes if you're holding the property at the time of your passing. The simple reduction um, was, was mentioned already. For estate tax purposes, land is generally valued at its maximum development potential. And so um, that can generate high estate taxes. And an easement limits the amount of development that can occur. And so it lowers the appraised value of land. So in other words, heirs will have to only pay estate taxes on preserved farmland values rather than full development values. So that's the reduction. And then the exclusion, um, a 1997 law, federal law, provided um, further estate tax incentives for properties subject to a qualified conservation easement. And um, that allows for 40% of the value of the land to be excluded from the estate. Um, and the exclusion is in addition to the reduction, the reduced value that you're already seeing. Um, another way that uh, landowners, this, these apply when a property is already in easement at the time of the landowner's passing. However, you can also donate uh, through or through an estate can donate an easement and take advantage of these tax benefits that way. It has to be within a certain amount of time before you file your estate return, but that's a tool that some people uh, use after the fact in estate planning. Hey, what's the, uh, the unified tax credit now? What is the amount for estate taxes? Is it three and a half million or something? I am not, I'm not positive on that. To share. The um, it's yeah. I'm not sure. I can't answer that for certain. If somebody buys the property after you donate it, they get no tax advantage, right? Um, Other than the property taxes. Right. Well, if but if the property is under easement, the estate it would still be reduced in the factoring of the estate taxes. Okay, so in five years, if we sold the property to somebody, it's their heirs that get the estate tax. Right, okay. yeah. So the property tax benefit is for county and state property taxes on the unimproved land. And for the unimproved portion of the property, you'll pay the property tax will be zeroed out for 15 years. You will still pay property taxes on the improvements, um, that area, but for the unimproved portion, it will be zeroed out and after the 15 years, uh, it will revert, revert to the highest agricultural rate unless you are uh, in some sort of management plan or actively um, managing it in some way to reduce that to a lesser agricultural rate. Um, sure. The mm -hmm. On the unimproved portion, um, so you would still pay the tax on the improved acre, but on the unimproved portion, it would be zeroed out. So when I look at my assessment, I can see the breakout of the Yeah, property. yeah. But it says after a period of time, then you go up to the highest ag rate at that time. But right now, we're at the lowest ag rate, so we can possibly get bumped up. No, if um, you're in the lowest ag rate now, I assume, because you are, Jewish. yeah, so that's what... If you're in that stewardship plan in 15 years, then 
Yeah. You would. Just, no. So that would make a big difference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I didn't know they had two different ag rates. They have like two different ag rates for your property. Stewardship plan. I mean, there's only one ag rate that just gets bumped up based on the year and what the value of the property is the year that you get bumped. Like when you sell a house, you get bumped. Because of the increased market value right. from the sale. That was just the value at the time of the assessment. Well, there are different properties, so with a different tax rate, like for people in the ag land, it's usually based on, depends on the county, but it's based on the soil type and productivity. But there's also a woodland, woodland uh, uh, management you know, tax, tax mm -hmm. rate. So if you were in a forest stewardship plan, either under a forest conservation, conservation management agreement or just a regular forest stewardship plan, that has a, a different rate. Than, than it would be for just for agriculture. So you should be able to somehow look online at the county rates. You should be able to see that that's public record. So yeah, you have when to look up and see how they assess uh, farmland. In many cases, ag land is assessed based on the productivity of the soil, but it, in other counties, it's set at a yeah, it varies by county, so I would check, call your office if it's not available online the, to understand. The, this question and many others, is check with your local county forester because they, they know all this stuff off the top of their head specific to your county. And um, there are several options <coughs> within the category of incentives and so we will get to tell you about on the new situation. Also, um, <laughs> I mean, you had a 15-year limit there, and then it was, but now, and in our, in our, our state has approved, and each county can adopt it, and I know Prince George County has adopted it, that if your land is in conservation easement to perpetuity, you get uh, tax credit on that land. You don't pay any taxes on that land. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, that also varies by county, so the, at the county level, you may also want to check with your county for those specific the specifics. Yeah. Good. Yes. Thank you. Are you going to have like an example? I don't run through the numbers. Um, I mean, it'd be interesting just to, to have a case, simple case. Given. Yeah. You have the federal, the state. I mean, on our website, actually, if you go there, they we do have a couple of examples that run through some scenarios and the numbers. Um, but sorry, I don't have that. <laughs> I don't have that in here today. So um, this slide, I, I'm not sure why I included it, but um, I guess the long and short of it is that our um, easements are based, we write them based to make them a qualified federal uh, IRS qualified easement. And so these are the tests of conservation purpose that we look to meet so that you are eligible if you so choose to uh, take the federal deductions and um, for the estate tax benefits and we do everything in our power we stay educated and stay up to date on what the IRS is looking for but the IRS is very clear in telling us that only they can guarantee your tax um, deduction and benefit but just so you're aware the conservation tests um, include these four points and so outdoor recreation or education most of our easements don't fall in this category some of our newer urban easements may um, allowing public access to properties um, most of our rural easements will fit into the second two bullets which are which include habitat and uh, general pres preservation of open space including farmland and forest land and that includes uh, scenic enjoyment for the public and also meeting um, tests of policy at the federal and state level of conservation policy that provide public benefit that way. Another way uh, to meet the test is through preservation of historically important land area or certified historic structure. Um, and we do have quite a number of easements that take um, historic characteristics into consideration but we are not the expert in structures and so if you have a historic structure and you want that to be part of the easement we would consult with Maryland Historical Trust
for that um, if that's your desire. But most of our easements fall in the middle two categories. So a little bit about the process. Um, it begins with a conversation. So you give me a call or the planner that's working in your region and um, we come out for a field visit. We see the property and talk with you about what your goals are and uh, what you want to see in the easement. And we go back and we do our background research and we develop a draft easement for you. All our easements are based on a model template, but they're all customized to each individual property. And we'll go back and forth until uh, we're all satisfied with the terms of the easement. And um, the appraisal process that we mentioned, um, the appraisal can be done either before the easement is donated, recorded in land records, or after. If it's done before, we just have to be within 60 days of when it will be recorded. So um, we'll just communicate about when that, when we're to that point so that you can make sure it falls within the 60 days. If it runs over, you can get an update of the appraisal, but it's easier for you if it's within those 60 days. Otherwise, it can be done anytime up until when you file your taxes for the year. Uh, lien subordination. This is sometimes the longest uh, part of the process. If you have a deed of trust or a mortgage on the property, um, we have to have the bank sign a subordination. Because these, we're promising that these um, easements are in perpetuity, the worry is that if for some reason the mortgage was defaulted on, that the bank, since the bank's um, mortgage is ahead of the easement and land records, that they could say that the easement um, doesn't exist um, anymore. So we have to work with them to get a subordination so we ensure the permanence of it. And again, that can be sometimes the longest part of the process and most difficult, um, so we like to get started on that with you early. Um, all of our easements go before our board and they are the decision-making body. They approve or deny the easement. Uh, we try to take things to them that they can approve. Um, the baseline of the property is conducted and that is kind of um, capturing the moment in time when the easement is donated. So um, it includes maps and it includes um, background on all of the conservation values, the habitat, um, photos of all the structures, all of those things. And at that point, all parties can sign and we take all of our easements to the State Board of Public Works, which makes you eligible for the Maryland specific tax benefits. And then we record the easement in the land records and we follow up with you with all of the, all of the documents that you might need to file the different uh, tax benefits. So what is the cost, out-of-pocket cost to a landowner who's looking at going through a process like this? Um, what is the, the trust providing and so on? Well, uh, the cost of the landowner could include if they're getting an appraisal, and so that would be, it's a dedu deductible cost, but that would be a cost to the landowner. Um, if you seek a legal counsel, um, some landowners do, some landowners don't. And uh, if you have a financial advisor or an accountant, that would be a cost to you as well. Those are the main things that the... Some local land trusts that require a number of planning fees. Right, that's, yes, thank you for bringing that up. Um, so some stewardship uh, is our, when we accept an easement, we are accepting the responsibility to ensure that the terms of this easement are maintained through future generations. And so not just um, the current landowner, but all successor landowners. as a huge responsibility. And so MET, actually, um, we will request you to consider a donation after the easement process is over. We have the benefit of being a um, funded partially by the state. And so um, but we also have a greater obligation than the state covers. And so we ask landowners to consider 
contributing to those costs. But our local land trust partners are for the most part all nonprofits, and so they have an even greater need to raise funds. And so every land trust is different in how they do it, but some do require a stewardship contribution up front. Some um, do it in all different ways, but that, that would be a cost also associated with. What, what is that cost? It varies um, by the land trust and how they calculate it. Some have a flat fee, some base it on a percentage of the value of the donation. Um, MET asks, asks um, for a consideration of $5,000. It really ranges. What about, what is, what, are the, what is the percentage or what is some representative of the other local land trusts? Um, I think one in my area, they ask for between a 1% to 3% value of the, the appraised value. Um, it varies by land trust. Um, some, it is, it is a very serious um, obligation that they're taking on, and so some do require it, but I'm sure that, um, you know, I'm not sure, but I would think that in a lot of cases, um, the land trusts I work with, if there is a extraordinary, extraordinarily exceptional piece of property, um, being considered, they may be able to find funding in another way. It really varies with who you're working with and what um, what their criteria is. MET, um, it's not a requirement, but you know we do ask. Mm -hmm. The appraisal fee was deductible. Is that deductible from what? Um, if you if you itemize your deductions, you can add it to your basis. This appraisal is an appraisal for the conservation easement to do with your donation, and so um, it is it is deductible in some way. Cool. Yeah. Did you have a question? Oh, I was just going to mention that some sometimes the land trust sets it up that that one percent they might require is can be one percent every time the property is sold in the future. Right. So you're continually funding over time the stewardship of that property. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you just get the 1% up front and, well, mm -hmm. right. it doesn't yeah. go very far in right. perpetuity. Right. Mm -hmm. So donated funds, where do they go to? They go to capital budget, administrative costs? Um, for MET, they go into a dedicated stewardship funds. So it pays for things associated with the ongoing monitoring and stewardship and enforcement of the, the easements. And is that done on a yearly basis? We do. Um, we've just recently uh, switched to an annual monitoring schedule, and so we try to get out to properties um, annually. We coordinate it with the landowner, of course, to begin with. And um, some year I call it short form and long form. Sometimes the visit will be like a quick 15 minutes, basically us driving by, driving on the property, seeing the developed area, seeing that, you know, Nothing really looks different than the past year, and that's it. Other times we might want to um, more extensively see the boundaries um, and the rest of the property. Mm -hmm. That's right. We have a volunteer monitoring program where um, we have uh, trained volunteers that help us um, meet that obligation. So, just so I understand this, Mm -hmm. I know that's so what you're saying is that like for example let's say that it was a local land trust and MEP that means that that would be money you'd have to come up as a landowner you have to possibly have to come up with five ten thousand dollars in cash in order to do the easement it depends on with I can only speak for MET um, and it is not a requirement uh, we ask for it after the easement's in place uh, consideration of a donation and you can be we we uh, start uh, 
we ask 5,000, it can be done as a one-time donation, it can be as a pledge over a number of years. Um, yeah, but for the local land trust, depending on how they operate, it may be an upfront expense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, most landowners will find that it is worth it to them and the money that they're going to save and the tax benefits um, to go forward with the easement. And even some landowners that I've had um, say, you know, we don't make that much money, we don't have that much income, but when they look into it, um, they find that it is still worth it for them to get the appraisal and take those benefits. So it really is a case-by-case -case basis depending on uh, how many development rights that you might be giving up and um, your individual income. Right. Depends on the development potential. Yeah. So where, where would you look? You know, we can look at market values for land sales and understand the appraisal process. So the trust aspect of it is a, a source of information about what properties are appraised for. Um, we, um, we can probably tell you at a county level, but it varies. You know, the market these days has been has varied a lot over the last couple of years, and so we used to be able to provide an average. Um, actually, who I would refer you to would be, if your county has a, an ag preservation program, they may be able to tell you values a little more specifically than we can, because we, um, we may not have done an easement in your area for a few years, and so any figure that we could give you would not be that accurate. But the ag preservation programs would probably be a little more in tune with that. Mm -hmm. I have one question, 17. <laughs> oh, I have two questions. Um, you have a requirement to have a 100-foot buffer on property. Is there any definition of what your buffers are? They're vegetated buffers, and so um, it depends on the property. Um, do you have a specific property that you're thinking of? Yeah. What is what is Except the... Breath. Okay, so it could be grass. We would pr prefer that it not be mowed um, all the way down to the buffer all the time, but as long as it's vegetated, it would count. <laughs> you have a question? Have you ever done um, easements on urban land, smaller lots of urban land? Yeah, that's something that we've just developed in the last year. I guess we adopted that policy. And so there are two cases on the eastern shore where we have urban easements. Um, and they, the criteria there is slightly different in what we're looking for. I mentioned before um, public access is something that we're really looking for in those instances. Um, but yeah, it's not our traditional easement, um, but we have just started getting into that. Yeah. Values themselves would be the larger overall values would be in the easement, correct? But then there would be a requirement there's a stewardship plan. With the stewardship plan required, uh, you know, even though it changes hands, you know, hopefully. Yeah, that's next. Okay. Good. <laughs> So our standard language um, just calls for a sediment and erosion control plan if there's to be any harvest or management activities. But if the woodland and the forest is a main conservation value, 
we would um, like to see a forest stewardship plan as a part of a requirement of the easement. And so the, or the um, objectives of the forest stewardship plan could be any number of things that you choose, but um, we think that's best managed through a plan rather than specific terms in the easement. And so um, in those cases, we have forest stewardship plans as a requirement. And one other thing I'll say about that is that um, when FIDS habitat, forest interior dwelling bird species habitat, is a um, conservation value of the property, we like to see that as the primary objective, and then the secondary objective can be any number of things that you want it to be, but we, when habitat is involved, um, and if that is a key conservation value of the property, then um, those have to be listed in, in the easement. So saying that there is a forest stewardship plan that considers that habitat as the primary objective. Um, a lot of times when I work with forest landowners, if the property is mostly forested, but there's not necessarily any kind of habitat, I leave it more open-ended so that that objective can change. Right. And which, which doesn't make sense to have an easement in perpetuity where there's no management involved. Yeah. Deeds or, and, you know, it's going into this where forest stewardship plan, but, you know, there's also cases where people put in, like you say, his habitat in, in some ways almost creating a no cut easement, in essence, in some cases. You know, so I'm not sure how you do I'm just curious how you deal with that because. That could be written in a way where basically, okay, it's great to create this habitat, but it's so restrictive, it's almost like a no-cut easement. I don't know if you've run into that. So we haven't run into that. We have seen the error of our ways in the no-cut easements that we allowed. Um, and for all the reasons that you stated, those are problematic. And we much prefer that it be flexible over time and have a plan that governs the management rather than saying in the easement, that's what's going to happen. Um, with the habitat um, as an objective, we haven't seen that as a problem. Um, but we still, we feel that the plan um, helps take care of that in some way. But, you know, if you, you see that as a problem, I mean, I, I like to stay away from saying what those objectives will be, um, but if the habitat is like the prime reason for the easement, I think it's important to have that as an objective that is in the easement. But it's all, it's all flexible. Um, one example of an easement, um, kind of a unique example, um, was this property in Baltimore County where the landowners had established uh, the property as a forest mitigation bank with the county and included both forest retention areas and um, forest and wetland restoration. And this property was surrounded by other protected lands. It had a portion of a trout stream on it, um, a lot of scenic road frontage, and a lot of the property was in the 100-year floodplain. And at the time that these landowners came to us, uh, the MET policy wouldn't have allowed us to consider a mitigation site for an easement. But we saw this um, property and, you know, it really made sense for an easement. An easement could, you know, really help this mitigation bank um, survive into perpetuity. The mitigation bank itself didn't remove the development rights. And so there are extra benefits of having a conservation easement. And so MET worked um, through this and changed our policy, updated our policy, because we you know, realized that landowners, it's becoming harder to you know, get income streams from your property and use, use them in unique ways. And so we, our hesitation before this was that we didn't want to preserve something that was allowing development elsewhere. 
but we also saw that there was, you know, great value in protecting sites like this with an easement, and so we, we changed with the times. And so we learned from our mistakes, like no cut language. Um, and that's why our documents now are more flexible to take them into perpetuity and make them, you know, a able to be steward and stewarded into perpetuity. So that's just... Yeah, I um, I can't think of any specific case, but I know they are problematic, and so we can amend an easement if it strengthens the conservation of it. And so, and if an argument can be made that um, changing that language in some way would benefit the property, the conservation values that the original easement was intended to protect, then I would think that we could amend it to, you know, allow a stewardship plan to take care of the forest rather than strict no-cut language. But it really depends on the easement document and the intentions that were there and, you know, what, what's being proposed to change. But it has to be a positive to... You can work with the county forester or a, any licensed Maryland forester. Okay, so if, um, like, what he suggested, suggested he, you just talk to the county forester and say, hey, this could be changed, and then you work it out with the, the owner and maybe just provide them assistance, I guess? You mean if it had no cut language? or? Yeah, yeah, just because, I mean, what he's saying is, is I, I agree. Yeah. You know, that it was bad language from the get-go. You'd have to talk with us first, and we could... Okay. It would have to be changed in our document first, and then... But the owner would have to understand. Right. Yeah. The owner would have to initiate that. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. I remember the conservation easement agreement is a legal document that's wrapped up in the deed of the property, so it's not something you can just change with the conversation that has to... But the owner has the, the most leverage. Um, well, the recorded document is what we all have to abide by, and so, but we're open to that conversation and to go through that process, so it just, it's really case specific, but the, the landowner should come to us and start that discussion. Sorry, mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, when you work with Maryland Environmental Trust, we take care of recording, and um, there is no fee because we're affiliate, affiliated with the state. So then my original question was, the appraisal of the property that you're donating, like you, right now there's an appraisal based on the county taxes or whatever, so let's just say it's $100,000. Could you guys come in and say it's lower because it is swampland or something? Could you no. that appraisal down? No, the appraisal... Um, that is required for a conservation easement is unlike any other appraisal that you may have for your property. Mm -hmm. And so, again, it's going to look at the market value, what selling your property today, um, what that value would be, and then the rights that you're giving up in the easement, essentially the development rights. Um, it will take a look at that, and it will look for properties of similar, um, hopefully it can find other conservation easement properties that have sold and see what similar properties are selling for and get a value of the property with an easement on it. And so the difference in the value of the property today for what you could get versus with the easement and what you can get is the value of the easement. So it's there, it's unlike any other so appraisal. Right. But the county assessment's based on what your property taxes are, and um, they seem to be 
you're looking at the donation, the, the 50% of your AGI thing is based on what they appraise it at. So if they appraise your property at 80,000 bucks, you're only looking at being able to deduct that 80,000 over 15 years. But if the value of the property is 100, you're losing that 20. That's my question. Does that make sense? So, so you don't, understand yeah, you don't want it to appraise lower. You want yeah, it to appraise yeah. it. But I think because it's value of your donation. I think what she said is that it's up to the amount of the appraisal would be easier. Their their appraisal. Right. So it could be lower. It could, it, yeah, right. That's possible, though, right? Right. Is it possible or not? I'm not sure I'm understanding. I'm sure I'm following. <laughs> 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 the county appraises. They, no, they, they have, have an assessment. assessment, but it's still, you're looking at, if you're trying to figure out your case study, what you guys are talking about, running a case study, running the numbers, you use your assessment to run your case study to figure out about how much you make on the deal. The case study is going to be based on it. Right. And it's usually lower than most yeah. too, so. Which is better. Okay. Up to <laughs> I just have one other question about how you work with local land trusts. So folks here know there's a lot of local land trusts around. And my understanding is that MET usually signs on the easements that a local land trust initiates. Is that um, or not always? Not always. A lot of times landowners will come to us first because they found us first. Um, and then we will bring a local land trust partner in. Um, we like to... Uh, when a landowner comes to us first, we like to include the local land trust up front to begin negotiations because we each have um, separate but equal responsibilities for the easement. And so likewise, if a, if a landowner goes to a local land trust to begin with, um, we like to be involved, you know, all along the way. So it, it goes both ways. And there's a list of local land trusts on your website? Yep. And I have cards here if anyone is, you know, has questions so down the line. This is from last year. I think you probably have this, the same uh, publications in your manual this year. Jonathan mentioned this one. And it doesn't go into much detail about easements, but it does have on the fourth page um, a little comparison of the different tax abatement programs. And basically in this little case study or example, Without using a program it's thirty dollars per acre um, per year, I believe that is. And then with the tax abatement programs, the options are two fifty six per acre uh, in FCMA or four fifty eight or three oh eight an acre in FMP. So that's just an example of the type of savings you can have. Now that varies depending on again your um, how valuable your land is based on its location and so forth. Um, also, just wanted to mention fairly quickly, these are the other pu publications in that section on estate planning. And this, uh, the gray manual you have is a great resource for estate planning as well. And estate planning are basically, uh, it's basically the working with the legal tools for ensuring that the future of your land um, fits or meets the vision of it that you have after you're gone. So, um, you know, it's things like wills and, and taxes and that sort of thing. And that's definitely an important part of ensuring the future of your land. But what often gets dropped and forgotten, because it's not quite as obvious, is what we would call succession planning, which is a little different. Um, estate planning is a legal tool. Succession planning is more touchy-feely. It's about working with your family to ensure that they're on board with your plans. Because if they're not, um, as soon as you're gone, things can fall apart. So it's also important to, to talk with your family that, and make sure that they have the same values that you do or that you're at least on the same page to understand where each other is coming from, which can often be even harder than figuring out all the legal stuff. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to mention that because it is so important to um, to make sure that not just that the legal things are in place, but that your family is on board with making sure those same things happen. So, no. Yeah. Right, so if there's any other questions or comments, Just remember whether the will is relevant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh -huh. Thank you.
August 5th. <laughs> you had a question? No, um, our easements are perpetual, and so, no. 